Welcome to theCUBE, I'm Dave Nicholson, and this is part of a continuing conversation about managing risk in the digital supply chain. I have with me today, Vincent Danin, Vice President of Product Security from Red Hat, and Luke Hines, Security Engineering Lead from the Office of the CTO at Red Hat. Gentlemen, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Great to be here. So let's just start out and dive right into this. Uh, Vincent, what is the software or digital supply chain? What are we talking about? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, software supply chain is basically the uh, software that an end user would get from a vendor, or in our case, we're talking about uh, open source, so upstream. Um, it is the software that comes in uh, that is part of your uh, package, operating system, applications, uh, it could be something that you get from one vendor, multiple vendors. Uh, so we look at, you know, in the example of Red Hat, we are one part of a customer's uh, software supply chain. So it's interesting that it's coming in from different areas. Uh, do we have a sense for the ratio of uh, kind of commercial software versus open source software that makes up an enterprise today? I think that's a really hard thing to answer and I think every enterprise or every company would have it a little bit different. Uh, depends if you have uh, an open source vendor that you choose, you may get a significant amount of software from them. Uh, certainly you're not going to get it all, right? Uh, for as an example, Red Hat provides thousands of open source packages. Uh, we certainly can't provide all of them. There are millions that are out there. Uh, so when you're looking at a specific application that you're building, chances are you could be running that on a managed platform uh, or an enterprise supply platform but there are going to be packages that you're going to be obtaining from other sources uh, and other communities as well in order to power your applications. So Luke, that sounds like a kind of a, kind of a vague situation where we're looking at in terms of where all of our software is coming from. So, so what do we need to know about our software supply chain in that context? What do we need to understand uh, before we even get anywhere near the idea of securing it? Uh, what are some of the issues that arise from that? Yes, yeah, so as Vincent touched upon, it's, it's a very wide ranging ecosystem, multiple sources when we're talking about open source. So essentially, awareness is key, really. I, I think a lot of people are really not aware of the sources that they're drawing from to create their own supply chain. So there's there's multiple supply chains. You know, you can be somebody like Red Hat that, that provides software. Okay, and then people will leverage Red Hat as a, for their own supply chain, you see. And uh, then you have the cloud provider and they have their own source of software. So it's really, I think that the key thing is the awareness of, of how much you rely upon that ecosystem. Before we look at the securing of, of the supply chain, it's really, it's really understanding your supply chain. And just to follow up on that, what so get, can you, uh... And I'm sort of checking my own level of understanding on this subject. Um, when you talk about open source code, um, you're talking about a code base that is often maintained essentially by volunteers. Isn't that correct? A mix of volunteers and paid professionals where a company has an interest in the open source project. And, um, but predominantly I would say it's, well, I'm not entirely sure, but volunteers make up a substantial part of the, the ecosystem, that is for sure. So it's a mix, really. Some people do it uh, because they, they enjoy writing software. They want to share software. Okay. Other people also enjoy working software, but they're in the position that a company pays for them to, to work on that software. So it's a mix of both. Vincent, give us a reminder of, a reminder why, of why this is important from kind of a, a you know, a little bit of a higher level. Step back from, from the uh, from the data center view of things, from the IT view of things. Just from a societal perspective, Vincent, what what happens when we don't secure our digital supply chain? What are the things that are put at risk? Well, there's a significant number of things that are placed at risk. Um, the security of the enterprise itself. Right, so your own customer data, your own internal corporate data uh, is placed at risk if there were a uh, supply chain breach. Uh, but further to that, for a software provider, and I think that in a lot of cases, most companies today are software providers or software developers, you actually put your own customers at risk as well, not just their data, 
but their actual, um, you know, the things that they're working on, any workloads that they may have, uh, you know, an order that they might place as an example, right? Uh, so there's a number of areas where you want to have the security of that supply chain, the software components that you have um, figured out, right? You want to be on top of that because there is that risk that trickles down uh, when it comes to any, any event. I mean, we've seen that with breaches earlier this year, you know, one company is breached, multiple companies end up being breached as a result of that. So it's really important. I think we all have a part to play in that, um, I always view it as it's not just about the company itself. So, I mean, speaking from a Red Hat perspective, I don't look at it as we're just securing Red Hat, we're securing our customers. And then we're also doing that further for their customers as well, right? Because they're writing software that's running on the software that we're providing to them. So there is this trickle down effect that comes. Uh, and so I think that every link in that chain, I mean, it's, it's wonderful that it's called a supply chain, right? It's only as strong as its weakest link. So our, our view is how do we, how do we strengthen every link in that chain? I mean, we're one part of it, but we're kind of looking a little broader. What can we do upstream and how can we help our customers uh, to ensure the security of their part in that supply chain? Yeah, I want to talk about that in a, in a broad sense, but let's see if we can get a little bit more specific in terms of what some of these um, what some of the chains look like, uh, because it's not just really one chain when you think about it, there's the idea of inherent flaws that can be caught. And then there and then there are the things that bad actors might be doing to leverage those flaws. So you've got all of these different things that are converging. So first, and Vincent, if you want to toss this to Luke back and forth, it's, it's up to you guys. Um, what about this issue of inherent flaws in code? We, we referenced this idea of the maintainer community. Um, how do you, what's the, what, what are best practices for locking that down to make sure that there aren't inherent uh, flaws or, or uh, uh, security risks? I'll, I'll take a stab at it and then I'll let Luke follow up with maybe some of the technologies that Red Hat provides. But, uh, and again, speaking to Red Hat as a part of that chain, when we talk about inherent risk, there's a, a vulnerability that's present upstream. You know, we pull that software into to Red Hat, we package it as a component of one of the um, you know, pieces of software that we provide to our customers. It's our responsibility to pay attention to those upstream uh, potential vulnerabilities, potential risks, and correct them in, in our code, right? So that might be taking a patch from upstream, applying it to, to our software, might be grabbing the latest version from upstream, whatever the case might be. But it's our responsibility to uh, provide that protection for that software, to actually remediate that risk. And then our customers can then install the update and apply the mitigations themselves. Uh, if we take a look at it from you know, when we're looking at multiple suppliers, right? You'd asked earlier about, you know, what part of it is Red Hat and what part of it is, you know, self-service open source. When you look at that, the the work that Red Hat's doing there as a commercial provider of open source, an end user for that little bit that they're going to grab themselves that Red Hat doesn't provide, it's going to have to do all of those things as well. Right? They're going to have to pay attention to that risk from upstream. They're going to have to pay attention to any potential vulnerabilities and pull that in. Uh, to figure out, you know, do I need to patch? Where do I need to patch it? Uh, that's something we didn't really touch on was an inventory of the software that you have in place, right? I mean, you don't know that you need to fix something. You don't even know that it's running. So, I mean, there's a, a lot of considerations there where you have to pay attention to a lot of sources. Certainly there's uh, metadata, automation, all of these things that make it easier, but it doesn't absolve us of the responsibility uh, across the board to pay attention to these things, whether you're grabbing it from upstream directly or from the vendor, and it's that vendor's responsibility to then be paying attention to things upstream. Yeah, so Luke, I'm gonna, I want to, I want you to kind of riff on that from the perspective sure. that yeah. let's just assume that Vincent was, Vincent was just primarily talking about the idea that okay, we've established that this code is solid, and uh, and and we've got a you know gold copy of it, and and we know it's okay. There aren't there aren't inherent problems in the code as far as we can tell. Well, that's fine. I'm a developer. I go out to pull code in to use, how do I know if it's not been tampered with? How, how do I know if it's in fact, the code that was validated during this, this process before? Uh, sure. What do you do about that? So th th there's, yeah, there's several methods there, but I, I just like to loop back to that point because I think this is really interesting around. So if you look at a, a software supply chain, okay. 
This is a mix of humans and machines, okay? And both have flaws, probably humans a bit more, okay? And a, su a supply chain, you have developers, okay? You have code reviewers, you have your systems administrators that set up the systems, okay? And then you have your machine actors. So you've got your build systems, uh, the various machines that are part of that supply chain. Okay. Now the the humans, there's a there's an attack vector there. Okay. Because typically they will have some sort of identity which they leverage to act for access to the to the to the supply chain. Okay. So quite often a developer's identity can be compromised. Okay. So a lot of the time the people will have a corporate account that gives them some sort of single sign-on access to multiple systems, okay? So if a developer's account, and this could be somebody in the community as well, if their account is compromised, then they're able to easily backdoor systems, okay? So that's one aspect. And then there is machines as well. There's the whole premise of machine software not being up to date. So when the latest nasty vulnerability is released, the machines updated, then the machines have their flaws, they can be exploited. So there's, there's, I would say there's a, you know, it's not just a technical problem, there is a, there's a humanistic element to this as well, around protecting your supply chain. And I would say the, a really good perspective to carry, when you're looking to how do I secure my supply chain, is treat it like you would a production system. Okay, so what do I mean by that? When we put something into production and we've got this very long legacy of, of treating it with a very strict security context around who can access that, people, okay, how much it's upgraded and it's patched. And we seem to not have this same perception around our supply chain and our build systems, okay, the integrity of those, the access of those, the, the policy around the access and so forth. So that's one giveaway that I would say is, is a real key focus that you should have is Treat it like a production system, okay? Be very mindful about what you're bringing in, who can access it, because it is the keys to the kingdom. Because if somebody compromises your supply chain, your build systems and so forth, they can compromise the whole chain, okay? Because a chain is only strong as the weakest link. And so so that's, that's what I draw upon it. And around the verifications, there, there is multiple technologies that you can leverage, okay? So Red Hat, We've got a very robust signing system that we use so that you can be sure that the packages that we get, you have non-repudiation that they've been produced by Red Hat. Okay, When you update your system, that's automatically looked after. Okay, And there are other systems as well. There's other new technologies that are, are starting to get a, a foothold Okay, around the provenance of, of aspects of your build system. So when you're pulling in from these uh, multiple sources of open source communities. You can have some provenance around what you're pulling in as well. And um, yeah, there's, 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 you know, I don't want to bite shed too much on the technologies, but there's some exciting stuff starting to happen there as well. So let's look at an example of mm -hmm. something because I, I think it's important to understand all of these different aspects. Um, recently, I think actually still in the news, uh, we found that some uh, logging software uh, distributed by Apache that's widely used in uh, people's websites to gather information about, uh, to help, you know, to help from a security perspective and to help from, uh, to help developers improve uh, things that are going on in websites. Um, a vulnerability was discovered. Uh, I guess first Alibaba, some folks re reported it directly to some folks at Ap Apache in the Apache organization. Uh, and then uh, of all people, some folks from Minecraft uh, mentioned it in a blog. Um, that seems like a crazy way to find out about something that's a critical, uh, a critical flaw. Now we're looking at that at this right now with hindsight. So with hindsight, mm -hmm. what could we have done uh, to to not be in the circumstances that we're in right now? Uh, Vincent, I'll toss that to you first. But again, if but if, again, uh, if if uh, if Luke is more appropriate, is more, let us know. No, it's it's a it's a great question, and uh, it's a hard. How did you question. let this happen, Vincent? How did you let this happen? <laughs> it wasn't me, <made>, promise. <laughs> um, but I mean, it, it is. It's it's a challenging, it's a challenging question. I mean, and there's a number of areas where I mean, we focused on a lot of what we perceived as critical software, right? So it comes to web server applications, DNS, uh, a number of the kind of the critical infrastructure, the powers of the internet. Uh, right or wrong, 
you know, do we look at logging software as a, as a critical piece of that? Well, well, maybe, maybe we should, right? Logging is definitely important as part of uh, an incident response or just an awareness of what's going on. So, I mean, yeah, it probably should have been considered a critical software. There's also, I mean, it's open source, right? So there's a number of different logging applications. And I imagine now uh, we're scrutinizing those a little bit more, but, you know, looking beforehand, how do you determine what's critical and uh, until an event like this happens? And it, it's unfortunate that it happens. Um, and I like to think of these as uh, learning opportunities, you know, certainly not just for Red Hat, but for, uh, I mean, this touches no, everybody. Of course. Yeah, this certainly, this is not, everybody. yeah, this is not an indictment of our entire industry. We are all in this together and learning every day. It just highlights how complex the situation is that we're dealing with. Right. It, oh, it truly is. And I mean, a lot of what we're what we're looking at now is how do we get tools into the hands of developers uh, who can catch some of these things earlier, right? And there's a lot of uh, you know commercial offerings. There's a lot of open source tools that are are available and and being produced uh, that are going to help with these sorts of situations moving forward. But I mean, all the tools on the planet aren't going to help if they're not being used, right? So I mean, there's there has to be an education and incentive for these developers. You know, particularly maybe in some upstream communities where they are labors of love and they're they're, they're passion projects. They're not sponsored or, or backed by a corporation uh, who's paying for these tools, right? To be able to use some of them um, and, and move that forward. I think that, you know, looking at things now, there is work to be done. Obviously, there's always going to be work to be done. Not all of these tools, and we have to recognize this, they're not all perfect. They're not going to catch everything. These tools could have been I mean, I don't know if if they were running these tools or not. They could have been, and the tools simply could not have picked them up. So, part of it is the proactive part. You know, we talk a lot about shift left and, and moving these things early into the development process, and that's great, and we should do it. It certainly should never be seen as a silver bullet or a replacement for a good response. And I think what the really important thing to highlight with respect to this, and I mean, this touches on the supply chain issue as well. Companies, especially those who never maybe saw themselves as a software development company really have to figure out and understand how to do appropriate response part of that is uh, awareness you know what what do you have installed part of it is uh, sources of information like how do i find out about a new vulnerability or a potential vulnerability and then it's just this the speed to respond right we know that a number of uh, companies they have you know, maybe it's a patch tuesday maybe it's a patch 26 of the month Maybe it's patch day of the quarter, right? We have to learn how to respond to these things quickly so that we can apply these mitigations and these fixes as quickly as possible uh, to then protect ourselves and protect our uh, the end users or customers that we have or to keep the kids from uh, using some backdoors in Minecraft, as it were. <laughs> yeah, this look, this is an immensely important subject. To wrap us up on this, Luke, I'd like you to pretend that you just got in got into an elevator in a moderately tall building and you have 60 seconds to share with me someone who already trusts you. You don't have to convince mm -hmm. me of your credentials or anything. I, I trust you. What tools specifically do you need me to be running? Tools and processes. You've got 60 seconds to say, Dave, if you're not doing these things right now, you're you're unnecessarily vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So uh, ready, ready and go. Luke. Okay, so automatically update all packages okay always stay up to date so that when an issue does hit you're not having to go back 10 versions and work your way forward that's a key thing uh, ensure that everything you pull in you're not going to hit 100 percent, but have a very strict requirement that there is non-repudiation it's signed content so you can verify that it's not been tampered with okay for your developers that are producing code run static dynamic analysis, API fuzzers, all of these sorts of tools, they will find some vulnerabilities for you. Um, be part of communities, okay? Be part of communities, help chop the wood and carry the water. Because the log4j, the thing is that was found because it was in the open, okay? If it wasn't in the open, it wouldn't have been found. And I've been in this business for a long time. Software developers will always write bugs, okay? I do. Some of them will be security bugs. That's never going to change, okay? So it's not about stopping something that's inevitable. It's about being prepared to react 
to react accordingly in a right and correct manner when it does happen so that you can mitigate against those risks. Well, we're here on the 35th floor. Uh, that was oh. that was amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Luke. Uh, Vincent, you were in the elevator also listening in on this conversation. Did, conversation. did, 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 did you miss anything? No, I mean, the only thing I'll, I'll say is that it's really helpful to partner with an, an enterprise open source provider, uh, be, it, be it Red Hat or anybody else. I don't want to toot our own horn, right? Um, they do a lot of that work on your behalf that you don't have to do. A lot of the things that Luke was talking about, those providers do. So you don't have to, right? And that's where you, you know, I like that you talked about, hey, you don't have to convince me that you, that, that I'm trusted, right? Or that I trust you. Um, trust, trust those vendors. They are literally here to do a lot of that heavy lifting for you, um, and trust the process. Yeah, it's a very, it's a very, very good point. Uh, and I know that uh, sometimes it's hard to get to that point where you, you are the trusted advisor. Uh, both of you certainly are. Uh, and uh, with that, I would like to thank you very much for an interesting conversation, gentlemen. Let's. Uh, Keep in touch. You're also you're always welcome on the cube, Luke. Second time getting a chance to talk to you on the cube personally, fantastic. Uh, with that, I would like to thank everyone for joining this very special series on the cube. Managing risk in the digital supply chain is a critical topic to keep on top of. Thanks for tuning into the cube. We'll be back soon. I'm Dave Nicholson saying thanks again. <laughs>